Hey, dude. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. You too. It's been a while. I know. I'm a what do you have going on in the back there? What book is that? What book is that? Oh, St. Mark's is Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Um, uh, this uh, it's it's one of my favorite books of the year, actually. Um, this uh, this girl, I can't think of her name right now. I'm sure. Oh, Ada Calhoun, she's a, a writer up in New York, and uh, she um, did the entire history of St. Mark's, like all the way back to the Stuyvesant Farm in the 1600s. Wow. And then, of course, you know, it goes up through, it, you know, into the 60s and 70s, where the rock and roll heyday and everything, and the punk scene of the 80s, and and uh, gentrification of the 90s. Like she goes through that, and and with the running gag throughout it that no matter what decade. And what generation you, you take, uh, if you ask someone, you know, what do you think about St. Mark's? They'd be like, oh, you should have been here 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, they like, were saying that in the 1930s about the 1910s. And, they, you know, it's like... It's like the, per, the perpetual death march of a place. Like, right. oh, you should have been there. When, <laughs> yeah, that's... That, and the, I mean, because the 70s, it, St. Mark's in the 70s was incredible. You know, like, the punk scene, that's just unbelievable. Yeah. So... Yeah, I can't even imagine how good it is. Nineteen ten. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really incredible book, actually. And all right, I'm gonna, I, totally going to read it. Yeah, not one of those types that I would have originally thought. Like, I would make this my favorite book of the year, but it was. I was so engrossed in it; it was so cool. So that's rad. Yeah, you've been doing all right. Yeah, everything's good. Yeah. Is this a good? Can you can hear me and you can see me? Yep. And your face okay. looks great. I mean, I've got a, I've got a huge Mac, so you're like wall size right now. So yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> Listen, this doesn't make anybody look good. You know, nobody <laughs> looks good on these things, but you're doing a fine job right now. So <laughs> you look very sweet as well. You've got nice, and you've got a nice backdrop. You got Jake Bug and St. Mark's is dead. You can see everything back there. I didn't even realize your, that. Your ecstasy, I like it. Yeah. Why well, should uh, I should show this? We'll start the interview right there. I know I, that guy. That's the new one. Yeah. Show me your fangs. You made a re- another really fun record. Thanks. Another fine record from Matt Nathanson. All right. That's what you do, man. Uh, and I feel like there's uh, a lot going on. We'll discuss that record, but uh, first, uh, Operation Smile. Yeah. C- congratulations. Like, hey. this sounds like a really cool thing to be a part of. Uh, will, you, will you tell me what, exactly what it is? Yeah, so <clears throat> Operation Smile is a pretty incredible organization that um, deals with kids that are born with cleft palates and cleft lips. And uh, and they just do a ton of work. Uh, they do mission work where everybody goes, and they and they uh, and they sort of provide for these kids um, that are born with cleft palate and cleft lip. So they do a gala every year, and uh, they give away an award to somebody who they feel like it, you know, does a lot of uh, charitable work. And so I, they gave me the award this year, um, and it was based on my work with Starkey, mm-hmm. which is a hearing aid company out of Minneapolis that does a lot of the same work as Operation Smile does, but they do it for hearing. So they go, the, the head of this, uh, of the Starkey Corporation is just this sort of incredible guy, he and his wife. And uh, and they just travel the world giving away hearing aids, and they call it giving the gift of hearing. Yeah. And yeah. so I've done a lot of work with them recently because I did a video with them in Peru for my song Headphones. And uh, it's just uh, – it's funny because I have very – I'm just donating kind of my time and some energy. But they, they really do the bulk of the incredible work. You know, they do all the heavy lifting and they – make it easy for people like myself to kind of insert into the process and then just sort of put effort and it, and then watch the results. And so Operation Smile and Starkey are kind of uh, birds of a feather in that way. They're just incredible organizations. And so anyway, long story short, I, I got to uh, I got the award this year uh, from Operation Smile and uh, got to play the event and it was really it was really fun. I mean that's got to make you feel good, you know, you talk about uh you know, an artist makes a song and you hope to inspire people and everything, but you're actually seeing that that's, that could happen out there, that that's actually a thing. Yeah, it's cool because it's cool to perpetuate good things. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I found I, when we shot the headphones video, it was kind of this idea of like, well, what kind of video do we want to do? Well, we could do that thing where we get to fa- where I get to fake make out with the model and we get to like make it look all nice. And, <laughs> right. and that's fun. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, <laughs> But I thought, like, wouldn't it be great to put the money that we're spending on this video towards actually a good cause? And so we flew to Huancayo, Peru, and spent two days there just sort of, like, helping out. And then and we brought this uh, kid 
shot the video and it ended up looking amazing and it also ended up really like uh really shining a light on the work they do so yeah, yeah i sort of feel like it's a good way to spend time you you, you don't think about or or consider musicians and a hearing compare uh, hearing impaired kind of going together you know, you know like and I've worked at a CD store where I've, I've, I've had some deaf folks come in and they're always looking for music. And that always impressed me, you know, that they were looking for something completely different uh, than what I thought I was able to offer, you know, and, and when you get out there. And I don't know, are they your easiest uh, audience or your hardest audience? You know? <laughs> it's funny because it's like there I had had a couple. There was a, a, a woman a couple of years ago, Jessica Stone, who was an incredible inspiration. She reached out to me and she had um, she had these sort of tumors that grew on her nerves, and she was going in to get surgery to remove the tumors, and she was going to be deaf. So it was part of the surgery, and that was sort of my first, like, coming to terms with this idea that like how fortunate I am and how fortunate we are to be able to have our senses that connect us to to our family, that connect us, that root us to our community, that connect us to music. And for me, the idea for the video was the song "Headphones" is about music and how music if it wasn't for music I would not have made it through my life that's not like a it just it just sort of saved my life repeatedly like I'm sure it did for you and it's like the idea of uh can you imagine not being able to have this as the lifeline that you know and and then all of a sudden it sort of opens up this whole thing about how important music is and how crucial it is to feel connected and it was this it's just pretty incredible inspiring stuff yeah well i'm inspired to hearing about it so uh good job you and, and, <laughs> stop it stop well, it no th there was another part of this because that's not the only thing you're doing there's also a feminist anthology that you're contributing to yeah like so, you're really reaching outside here and yeah. not the feminist thing i'm just like beyond music you know well, yeah it's funny the feminist thing uh is funny because this um this woman reached out to me and said hey i follow you on you know she's a she had done this bit about me and and my love of books, mm -hmm. and uh, and they and in this uh, site called um, Book Riot, and she had sort of laid out all all the times that in my social media that I had written about oh I'm buying this book this is a great book this is a blah blah, and I was super flattered by it and then and then I sort of got in touch with her and we and she said look I'm doing this young adult feminist sort of compilation. And I wanted to know if you wanted to write a, a piece. And I said, dude, that is pretty way outside of what I think I can do because I'm a straight white man. Like I can't yeah. – like I, I could have less – like like m my view of feminism and the way that it works is it's my job to, to clear space for that, right, in the world. Mm -hmm. It's like it's my job to sort of like give a platform for other people to, to express themselves. It's not really my place uh, – Anyway, that's how I feel. And so I kind of said, like, well, I don't know. I'd love to do it, and I'm flattered that you asked. And, and she said, don't worry about it. I, I want you to do it. I think you could do a great job. And so I'm sort of working on the piece now, kind of pulling it together and trying to figure out how as, as sort of like, a, again, as like a straight white man who has very little skin in the game of, uh, right. of oppression. Do you know what I mean? Like right, uh, right, right, to right. sort of, you know, where do I fit in this, um, in this thing? And so it's, it's really – flattering to have been asked and it's really fascinating and I'm doing a lot of sort of uh, sort of asking around to uh, my, you know people that I know that are super involved to kind of like all right to explain to me like this is how I feel about it bounce this back at me and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff so it's fun that's good because there's some pretty heavy hitters uh, in this compilation as well yeah uh, I've only seen a few of the names I remember Mindy Kalen being one of them it, it, it's something I actually get to talk about a lot on this series uh, with, with folks and most of the time with women because I'm always kind of curious about, you know, how it's handled. I, I live in what I would call the NPR bubble. You know, right. it, it doesn't, I don't have to deal with it around here. You know, it's every, everybody is equal in my world. And, you know, all sexes, all races, all uh, uh, sexualities and nationalities and everything else. So I'm, it's always like I come at it as a naive sort of way. When they break it down and say, well, it is, is equalness. Men and women, you know, equal time, equal pay and everything else. And I go, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's like I'm sorry. Did we have to? De is that st oh, that's still a thing? Damn, <laughs> I'm sorry. That sucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's the, the NPR, and I feel horrible. The, the NPR bubble is very similar to the San Francisco bubble uh, where I live, which is sort of. Uh, it's funny. A couple of years ago, I was talking to my wife about you know politics, and I said I can't believe that these things are issue. And she goes, "Dude, you live at a very 
but you live in the bubble, man. You live in the San Francisco bubble. Like everybody around you, there's a there's sort of um, a level of. I mean, we have our own problems, and we also have problems as well with racism in Oakland and sexism in corporate America. But it was just one of these things where, like, I'm surrounded most of the time by by people who have like minded you know views, and so uh, I had to kind of a couple of years ago I started to kind of crack open. Uh, you know, and now the way that the news is covering things, I feel like I'm getting an adult dose of the way that the world works. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's weird. Uh, yeah, it's a weird time. There's so much division in humans. Like, there's so much vocal, mm-hmm. v- vocal like division. It's a uh, and I, it, maybe it's always been this way. When I read books about history, you know, we were talking about that uh, Saint Mark's Place book, um, and the idea that that when you read it. When you read history, it really does repeat itself. It's the way it's always been. It's always been this way. Mm-hmm. Um, to and and there's always been this sort of balance of, you know, uh, things that I think are justified, and you know, and then things that feel like a grave injustice. There's mm-hmm. always been this, and so yeah, it's a weird it's a weird time, but it's really cool that that they're pulling together this thing, this compilation that she's doing. Well, that's one of the things I've I've really always been. Um impressed with you by is because you're kind of a pop songwriter and a lot of pop musicians would play it safe where i look on your twitter and like the paris attack rant uh, from a few days ago which you know i'm completely on board with you about but that's not playing it safe you know you're, you're saying some very definitive sided you know you, you've taken your side things like that and, and going after it and not afraid to slam trump and, and not afraid to slam you know, a, a certain idealism in racism and everything like that. It, it's completely commendable. But you don't get that from a lot of, uh, of, of you know, pop writers. Yeah, the, 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 the good news and bad news about my career is that it's not particularly like I, I, my voice is fairly small. Do you know what I mean? And so, so it allows me to do that thing. And so the backlash is a per- percentage wise, my backlash that I get is a small percentage than someone say, you know, whatever. But, uh, uh, John Legend, John Legend, Chrissy Teigen. I don't know her name, but she recently posted something about Planned Parenthood, and everybody kind of came at her from all sides. And so I have this. It's fortunate that I live in sort of again this sort of small world. But I'm also, as I sort of get o- older, I feel like um, there are things that are just kind of important. Do you know what I mean? And like, mm-hmm. like empathy and treating humans with kindness and. Uh, these kind of things are like fundamental truths and it's like, uh, and so I try very hard to not go on rants because, you know, it's just, it's just not really, because I, because I don't necessarily want to engage anybody in conversation. <laughs> like, like I don't necessarily. It's not a get, debate to you. No. And, right. and I, so I don't need people to illuminate to me how ignorant they are. That yeah. really depresses me. Like and so I would rather not go out on a limb unless it's something I feel so incredibly, Mm -hmm. you know, like needs to be said from me. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, but really, it comes down to that. Like, like I don't want to engage you in conversation about this. Like, like it's really, uh, even though that's again, it's sort of my job Mm -hmm. as a person who feels this way. It's my job to kind of be uh, to kind of. I feel it's important, so I feel like it should be spread, right? The word should be spread. But at the same time, it's really, it, it really crushes my soul when human beings come at me with ignorance and with... And then knowing that they're, they're your fans. Well, and yeah, or the best is on Facebook, it can really like it, it really branches out to other parts of the world so fast, like mm-hmm. someone likes it and then somebody else on their page sees it and then it is just like a free for all of people behind their computers just typing away. Right. And so I've started to realize that like the act of me getting involved on a, on, on a level of myself, like going and doing things, whether it be Peru or whether it be going and sort of donating my time at like a, a shelter or these kind of things, like this feels like where it really counts, mm-hmm. the action behind it. And as again, as I kind of, as I start to sort of get a little bit more, less like this mm-hmm. in my life and more kind of like this, I realize yeah, like me ranting on Twitter is one thing, but me actually going and sort of putting my effort towards something that I believe in is really it. And so, you know, this is what we do. We 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 hope to like evolve as people. Like I want to I want to sort of like die a more empathetic and kind and stronger human than I sort of was 
than I kind of became in my right. young life. And so that's, that's what it's all about. So it, it, it's really that kind of thing. But yeah, so sometimes I rant for sure on well, social media. Yeah, I mean, you, you've had a career that's, that's well over 20 years. I mean, what is it, 22, 23 years or something like that? Like, like in that point, it, it's, it's kind of like you saying, you know, being better than where you started out. Like we've been able to see you at all sports, which by the way, I was surprised in that. I didn't know that you had been doing it since 93 was your first album. Is yeah. that right? I was only six. That's what's incredible about my career. <laughs> Almost being on the cusp of 30 now, I see. Uh-huh, it's, uh-huh. You get older and better, mature. But yeah, so 93, I put up my first record. And it's crazy. And, yeah, and it's funny because the what it's my like my goal as an artist is to get as transparent as I can in the art. Mm-hmm. It's like it's really something that I'm that's difficult and it's something that I have as my priority is like how can my art speak very directly to who I am as opposed to shading out things and trying to present myself in a way that makes me look like enjoyable for people, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. like it's really uh, – when I started making music and when I, like my biggest song at this point is a song that's kind of this love song about this sort of and, – and you shade out the ugly parts of yourself so that people will sort of go, oh, man, you right. sound like someone I'd want to date or you sound like someone I want to be. Or, and, and I find that like the lasting art for me is the art that does the antithesis. It's the opposite of that, the art that really like shows the, the warts and the bones and the ugliness of the person writing it. That to me is the thing that lasts and really does – save me as like a person when I'm listening to it. Right. And so so I sort of feel like the more transparent I can get in art and then consequently because my art is sort of a reflection of my life, the more transparent I can get in my life about being as honest with myself and who I am to the people around me, then it's like, man, I, I could go out happy, man, if that's the answer. You know, if we can get to that place, uh, that's what it's about. So, well, I think that's really evident as you get towards the end of this new record, Show Me Your Fangs, uh, when you get to the Washington Fight song, and, and you've got the line right from the beginning, we fucked on the floor, you know, and it's it's not the most romantic version uh, of a log so- love song, and talking about uh, your mistakes uh, and everything else. And then the very next song, you're throwing your phone out the window, you know, it, it, it does, it gets, it, it's a darker record towards the end. Yeah, and it's and it's funny, there's a... It, I feel like Washington State Fight Song was a really cool song to write because we had. I went to Nashville and I was writing with this kid who I've been friends with for a while. And I said, uh, "Hey, I got this song idea." And he said, "What is it?" I said, "I want to call the song Washington State Fight Song." He's like, "Oh, that's such a great title." I said, "Yeah," and I have the first line. And he was like, "All right, what is it, man?" And I was like, "It snowed in Seattle." And we fucked on the floor. He's like, "Yeah, man, we can't do that. Like, that's a, like we're not." <laughs> and I said. And I said, man, we got to do it. Like, it just feels like the answer. Like, you know what I mean? And and if it's a line that I want to run away from, it sort of feels like a line I should run into. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, because I'm not, because the popularity contest of music is the part that is not the part I'm in it for. Right. You know, these days. It might have been the part that I was in it for back in the day. But as I start to sort of, as I start to realize, I start to feel secure in myself and confident. It becomes this thing of like, yeah, I don't, I don't need any more friends. Like, I don't need any more. Right. I, like, I need to be. I need to sort of do justice to the art. That's my job. Right. If I'm going to do art as for a living, I need to do it right. You know. Yeah, a friend of mine was just talking uh, earlier with me, and we were talking about um, biographies, and, and and she was saying that you know there's certain parts she would leave out, and I said you know th- when you think about the greatest bios that you ever read and the salacious parts. I mean, if you, if you can think about the book without those, like the book becomes really boring and you know, you just lose track of like, Oh, well, there's, there's a nice little charm life, I suppose. Yeah. And, Cause it's, it's kind of up to, it's up to the writer of their autobiography or whatever to like pull no punches because mm-hmm. that's you, what you want is you want to, re- we all are dying to relate and the more that you're honest about who you are, the the more – because this everything – everybody doesn't want to touch on that. Mm-hmm. So the more you touch on that, to me, the more impactful the art. Like, you know, you're reading a biography and you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened to that person. I totally relate to that. Mm-hmm. That is – you know, and then it – and then the more people can be honest with themselves about themselves, I feel like that's sort of the job of, of the book or the painting or the movie or the song, you know, that kind of stuff. When you look at yourself as a songwriter, 
you know, when I listen to your song, I, I think about you as a craftsman in a way, the way this song was built. And I, I don't know how you write. Like, I'm not saying it's either or, but you can look at someone like Paul McCartney, right. which which I sort of liken your songwriting to, you know, the style that, that Paul would do. I'm going to come hang out with you <laughs> all day. I will read. Yeah. I'll read your favorite books to you. I'm so excited about yeah. this. But like, <laughs> you know, versus someone and I don't know. Um, like like Tom York, which which seems like a very different writing process yeah. than maybe um, you know like Tom York would go the anti direction beyond the anti direction, uh, you know, just to spite the other direction or something like that. And I say you know it's probably you as a big Radiohead uh, a fan and everything else. But but when I look at when I listen to your songs, I do I think of them more like as a well crafted. And I'm not talking about the Nashville machine or anything like that. Right, you know, right. it's just the style. Is that accurate? You know, how, how would you put a song together? Yeah, they, they do not come. I, I, I read this Tom Petty uh, biography just uh, over the over mm-hmm. Thanksgiving break. And, uh, you know, that guy just sat down and like free fall and just kind of came out. Right. Like that guy, <laughs> not that he didn't craft his songs, but he really like moves from uh, seemingly from what I've read. He moves very much from sort of an emotional like vomit moment of like, mm-hmm. here it is. This is what we got, you know. And I am, I kind of, I relate more when I read about like Paul Simon cra- sitting there sort of beating himself up about le- lyrics or chord changes or melodies, that kind of stuff. I sort of feel like um, it, it just isn't easy for me to write for some reason. I, and I, I attribute it to my inner assassin that sort of like gets in the way and like goes like, nope, <laughs> that, like, nope, that's terrible. And like, uh, but, uh, but really... What it comes down to is, I don't know if I'm confident enough yet in my writing to, but I, so the crafts part of it is a, for me at least, is a really safe way to write a song. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I can, I can sort of go back to it. I have the original idea. I can go away from it. Like, and I always end up kind of circling back to the beginning, real close to what it was at the beginning. But I do spend time crafting, yeah, you know, yeah. like for better or for worse, you know. Well, and I've noticed the one thing, you know, that uh, makes your music so much fun is kind of finding your heroes in your music. You know, of course, last time we talked about it, you know, you're on the Modern Love Tour and it was very obvious because you're putting the title right there. You know, right. it's a bit of the David Bowie tribute uh, on this record, you know, and listen to Summertime. And, you know, and I can hear, you know, and I don't know, little bits of Sly in there or some of that AM 70s radio or something like that. Like this. Hold on, I'll show you. That's how you know how on you are. <laughs> Tell me how on. Ah, right there, right there. See, you can hear that. That's really fun, you know. And you're talking about it, crafting and crafting and music, and, and and doing it in that way. Like, I don't know. What do you do? Do you go? Hmm. I really like this artist. I can I can inject that into the message I'm trying to get out. Does that it's, come like so precisely like that, or do you almost do it without thinking? These days, it comes without thinking. Like I I try very hard to not overanalyze the situation. I try just to sort of like feel out what is going to work for me in it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, like for example, the track Summertime, the Golden Summertime that you're talking about, that the track just like felt so good. The the bass, like it was, cr- we created it and like the bass line just felt so incredible. And it felt so much like I was walking around in Brooklyn in the 70s. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like it just sort of had this feel to it that I kind of felt like I, I, I had to I had to, it just sort of, I, my brain made the connection and then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, let's gold in the summertime. That feels like a Sly in the Family Stone idea. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, music to me is, I like music. I have a Spotify playlist called I Like Music More Than I Like People. And it's like, <laughs> and it's actually true. Yeah. Like I, uh, music to me is a constant, st- I'm in a constant state of devouring music. Mm-hmm. I have s- stereo in every room. I have constantly going with me. So, and all I'm looking for is that moment of elation, like that to get off on. It can even be super depressing. It can be super uplifting. It doesn't matter. But I'm looking for that that switch to flip. Mm -hmm. And so, my so when I write, it's really hard to not turn off all the information that I've got stored away from my nerd music brain. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it'll kind of just show up. And sometimes I'll even write a line and I'll go, oh, wait a second, that's from an Aerosmith record right. from like, you know, like I can't say that, but, you know, so that kind of stuff, 
there's a lot of music in here. There's a lot of like music nerdness, and it and it and it definitely like spills in. See, that's that's the stuff that stopped me from ever trying to be a musician, right there. So it's completely commendable that you're able to use that <laughs> and then get past it. Because every time I sit down, I was like, no, that's something. That's something. You know what the hell with it? I'm out of here. It's unbelievable. Uh, and my references, the part that's so frustrating is it's not like I'm like, oh, Dylan did that. I'll be like, oh, that's the third Asia record. Like. <laughs> You know, like nobody cares right. about the third Asia record. You know what I mean? Or like, and here I am, like referencing the third Asia record. So somebody cares about it. Yeah, yeah. It's me and <laughs> the one kid I went to camp with yeah. who worked in the kitchen. And the bass player from Asia. Yeah, yeah. And John Wetton. Yeah. yeah. He's totally into it. He's like, mm, yeah, I man. Was, that was tasty. Was gone. But if we do a Google search, I believe he was out of the band by the third Asia record. We got to check that out. We got to make sure. Yeah. He might have been a, who knows? Yeah. He might have been. GTR at that point. Oh, anyway, my. anyway, somebody was in there going, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. I love this. <laughs> well, dude, it is so much fun talking to you every time. And uh, Show Me Your Fangs is another fine Matt Nathanson record. Dude, you rule. This is awesome. Thanks for doing this. And thanks for doing it. on. This is very, like, I love our future. Yeah, this is fun, isn't it? Yeah, this you is the way we'll do it if we move to the Mars. Yeah, well, this is, uh, you know, you're saying that uh, you love music more than you love people. We don't even have to, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, after this, we just click it off. There's no small talk after this. You go you go back to your room, you know? It's... You go right back to porn and right back to Reddit. <laughs> That's, That's right. That's right. Awesome. Matt, it's been fun talking to you. Thanks so much, and, uh, and I'll see you next time you're around. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. All right, see you guys. Okay, bye. It's too hard to sleep.